Hello there, YouTube! My name is Wind, Dr. Bubble, please call me Wind, and welcome back to Read With Me, the wonderful fun series where we sit down, we read, and we just relax. Uh, I don't have a lot of time today to sit down and read. I can read for a little while, of course, but uh, I do have some other things to get to today, so yeah, it can't take too terribly long. Um, but yeah, so we'll try and do what we can do. Also, yes, the sun is directly in my eyes, for anyone wondering, but I can still see! Woohoo! Anyway... Um, but we basically are going to go right back into reading Broken Throne. If you don't know, Broken Throne is literally just the bonus stuff for, uh, the Red Queen series. And we last time left off reading some of Steel Scars. And we read some of that. And we got up to a point where, uh, Farley was with Tristan and one or two others, I think. And they were looking for Will Whistle in the stilts. Uh, and if you don't remember, Mare is where, or the stilts is where Mare lived, uh, way before the whole, uh, stuff with, like, the prince and everything. So they kind of infiltrated Norda. And now they're trying to expand the operation. So right now we're in Steel Scars. Um, so we're just going to continue literally right off from where we left off, basically. Uh, I think there was a bunch of, you know, code things that I didn't read. Um,. Yeah, so we had read, like, a lot of few coins, or, yeah, they got pickpocketed, and I thought, I thought like, how funny would it be if that was me that pickpocketed them? Um, it says, the following message has been decoded. We got some decoded messages we gotta read, and then there's more of the story. Uh, let me really quick peek and see kind of how much more there is. Um, oh, there's a lot. Oh, there's another type of story thing. Hold on. Um, yeah, we still have some stuff. Okay. Okay, so we still got quite a while. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and jump right on into reading. Uh, we'll get as far as we can, and then at one point I'm going to have to stop. This video might be a little shorter than normal, and I'm sorry about that. But nonetheless, we're still going to get right on into recording, so... Okay. All right. The following message has been decoded. Confidential. Uh, senior clearance required. Day, day 11 of Operation Red Web. Stage 1. Operative, Captain Redacted. Designation, Lamb. Origin, Albinus Narda. Destination, Ram at Redacted. So basically, it's uh, Farley talking to her dad. Okay. Mm, excuse me. Albinus slash Stilts Whistle willing to collaborate with Stage 2. Uh, has eyes inside Summerton's slash King's Seasonal Palace. Also mention contacts within the Red Army at Corvium will pursue. Uh, rise, red is the dawn. Okay, and it says, the following message has been... Okay, we, I think we got that part. Okay. Operative is Colonel Redacted. Designation, Ram. So, Farley's father. Uh, origin is Redacted. Destination is Lamb at Albinus. Uh, not orders, too dangerous. Continue with Red Reb. Uh, and it says, day 12 of Operation Red Web, stage 1. Operative is Captain Redacted, Farley. Uh, designation Ram, origin, Syracus Norda. Uh, destination is to Ram at Redacted. Intent on re of Red Web, stage 1, is to introduce SG into Norda via existing networks, army within orders. The SG, I'm not sure that would be just yet. Uh, we'll probably get a context clue in just a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Red Army contacts invaluable. We'll pursue. Pass up message to command. En route to Corvium. Rise, right as the dawn. Okay. Operative is Colonel Redacted. Designation Ram. Origin is Redacted. Destination Lamb at Syracuse. Stand down. Do not proceed to Corvium. So here we see basically that uh, she's saying like, oh yeah, I'm going to head on to Corvium. And her father's like, no, do not go to Corvium. All right. Rise, right as the dawn. Okay. Operative. Gen okay, this one is General Redacted. So this is one of the generals, I think one of the higher-ups above um, the Farleys. Uh, designation is Drummer, so just a General Drummer. Okay, origin is Redacted. Destination, Lamb at Syracus, Ram at Redacted. Proceed to Corvium. Assess Red Army contacts for information and in Stage 2 slash Assess Removal. Rise for the Dawn. So right there the command is saying, like, no, go to Corvium. So, we're going to see why probably in a second. 
All right, day 12 of Operation Red Web. Operative, Captain Redacted. Designation, Lamb. Origin is Corvium from Norda. Uh, destination Command at Redacted. Ram at Redacted. Acknowledged. Clearly not too dangerous. Right, so does it on. Operative is Chrono Redacted. Designation, Ram. Origin, Redacted. Destination Command at Redacted. Please note my strong opposition to developments in Red Web. Lamb needs a short leash. So her father is making a job of like, you know, hey, pardon, you know, my opposite, you know, pardon the fact that I'm against this. It's just, uh, he's probably thinking like his daughter just needs that short leash, doesn't need to be kind of handled and stuff. But, all right, this one then says, operative, general redacted, designation drummer, origin redacted, destination is ram at redacted, and all they said was noted. Rise, rise, not. Okay. So now, uh, the first line I can see is, I can smell the choke from here. So they're talking about the choke now. So we're talking about the choke. And if you remember the choke, it was this basically barren wasteland where the battle was taking place. The Hundred Years Battle, as we'll call it. Okay. I can smell the choke from here. Ash, smoke, corpses. It's a slow day. No bombs yet. Ty fixes her eyes on the northwest horizon. And the dark haze in the distance that can only be the front that can only be the front of this pointless war. She served on the lions herself, albeit on the opposite side we are now. She fought for her Lakelander masters and lost an ear to a frostbite in winter in the trenches. She doesn't hide the deformity. Her blonde hair is pulled back tightly, letting everyone see the ruined stump her so called loyalty bought her. Tristan scans the landscape for the third time squinting through the scope of his long rifle. He lies on his belly, half hidden by the ropey spring grass. His motions are slow, methodical, practicing the gun range at Irabelle, as well as deep as well as the deep forest of the lake clans. The notches on the barrel, two scratches in the metal, stand out brightly in the daylight. Excuse me. Twenty two in all, one for every silver killed of that very weapon. For all his itchy paranoia, Tristan has a surprisingly steady tr trigger finger. From our place on the rise, we have commanding we have a commanding view of the surrounding woods. The choke some miles to the northwest, clouded even under the morning sun. In Corvium, another mile to the east. There are no more towns or here, or even animals. Too close to the trench lines for anything but soldiers. But they keep to the iron road. The main thoroughfare that passes through Corvium and ends at the front lines. Over the last few days, we've learned much about the Red Legions constantly moving, replacing defeated soldiers on the lines, only to march back with their own dead and wounded a week later. They march in at dawn in late evening. Evening. We keep our distance from the road, but we can still hear them when they go. Five thousand in each legion. Five thousand of our Red Brothers and Sisters reign to living targets. The poly convoys are harder to predict, moving when required and not in any schedule. They, too, are manned by red soldiers and silver officers, albeit officers of the useless kind. There's no honor in commanding a transport full of stale food and worn bandages. The supply convoys are punishment for silvers, and reprieve for, and a reprieve for reds. And best of all, they are poorly guarded. After all, the Lakelander enemy is firmly on the other side of the choke, separated by miles of wasteland, trenches, and popping artillery. No one looks at the trees as they pass. No one suspects another enemy already inside their diamond glass walls. I can't see the iron run from this ridge. The trees are in full leaf, obscuring in, in the blah, 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 obscuring the paved avenue. But we're not watching the road today. We aren't gathering intelligence from in troop movements. We're going to talk to the troops themselves. My internal clock tells me they are late. Could be a trap, Tristan mutters. Always eager to voice his panicked opinion. He keeps his eye firmly pressed to the scope in warning. He's been expecting a trap since the moment Will Whistle told us about his army contacts. And now that we're going to meet him, he's been on edge more than usual. If that's possible. Not a bad instinct to have, but not a helpful one at the moment. Risk is part of the game. We won't get anywhere if we think only of our own skins. But there is a reason only three of us are waiting. If it's a trap, we'll get out of it. I reply. We've beaten worse. It's not a lie. We all have scars and ghosts of our own. 
Some drove us to the Scarlet Guard, and some were because of it. I know the stain of both. My words are for Ty more than Tristan. Like all who escape the trenches, she's not at all happy to be back. Even if she isn't wearing a Lakelander's blue uniform. Not that she would ever complain about this out loud, but I can tell. Movement. Ty and I crouch lower, whipping in the direction of Tristan's gaze. The rifle nose tracks at a snail's pace, following something in the trees. Four shadows. Outnumbered. They emerge with their palms out, showing empty hands. Unlike the soldiers on the road, these four have their uniforms turned inside out, favoring stained brown and black lining over their usual rust colors. Better camouflage for the woods. Not to mention their names and ranks. I can't see any insignia or badges of any kind. I have no idea who they are. A calm breeze rustles the grass. It ripples like a pond disturbed by a single stone. It's green waves breaking against the four as they broach in single file. I narrow my eyes at their feet. They're careful to step in the leader's footprints. Any tracker would think only one person came this way. Not four. Smart. A woman leads. Her jaw like an anvil. She's missing both her trigger, fi both her trigger fingers. Unable to shoot, but still a sh soldier. Judging by the crags of wariness on her skin, on her face. Like the willowy, copper-skinned girl on her heels. Her head is shaved to the scalp. Two men bring up the ear rear. They are young. Both probably within their first year of conscription. Neither scarred or visibly injured, so they can be masquerading as wounded back in Corvium. Supply soldiers, most likely. Lucky to hold crates of ammunition and food. Although the second, the one at the very back, seems too slight for manual labor. The bald woman stops ten feet away, her palms still raised. Too close for both our liking. I force myself to stand from the grass and close the distance between us. Ty and Tristan keep still. Not hidden, but not moving either. We're the ones, she says. I keep my hands on my hips, fingers inches from the gun belted across my waist. A naked threat. Who sent us? I ask her in testing. Behind me... Tristan tightens like a snake. The woman has the bravery to keep her eyes from his rifle, but the others behind her don't. We'll whistle the stilts, she replies. She doesn't stop there, though it's enough for the moment. Children taken from their mothers. Soldiers sent to slaughter. Countless generations of slavery. Each and every one of them sent you. My fingers drum quietly. Rage is a double-edged sword, and this woman has been bled by both edges. The whistle will do. And you are... Corporal Eastry of the Tower Region. Like the rest, she towers behind. Oh, she gestures behind. I'm sorry, she gestures behind. To the other three still watching Tristan. I nod at him, and his trigger finger relaxes a little. But not much. We're, we're support troops, conscripted to Corvium. Will told me as such. I lie quickly. And what did he tell you of me? Enough to get us out of here. Enough to risk our necks for. The voice comes from the lean young man at the back of the line. He angles forward, around his comrade. His smile crooked, teasing, and cold. His eyes flash. You know it's execution if we're caught out here, right? Another breeze, sharper than the last. I force my own empty grin. Oh, is that all? We best make this quick, East Tree says. Your lot might protect your names, but we have no use for such things. They have our blood, our faces... This is Private Florence, Private Reese, and the one with a crooked smile steps out of line before she can say his name. He crosses a gap between us, though he doesn't extend a hand to shake. I'm Barrow, Shade Barrow, and you better not get me killed. My eyes narrowed him. No promises. So, here we see the moment, actually, where Farley met Shade. And if you guys remember, uh, Farley, Diana... She's the one who had Shade's baby. Uh, that's literally, they literally got together for a bit and, um, before Shade passed away. Or I should say it was killed, but it sounds more respectful to say he passed away. Um, but still, like, she had his baby, so this is great. This is all we, see, we get to see when they first meet. <coughs> Excuse me. Alright, uh, we have more decoded messages. Let me go ahead and read those. Day 23 of Operation Red Web, Stage 1. Operative? Captain Redacted, Designation Lamb, Origin Corvium, Norda, uh, designation, destination is Ram. 
Okay. Excuse me. So sorry. I gotta get one point before recording. <laughs> Alright. Core room intelligence enclosed. Four statistics. City map. Tunnel overlay. Army schedule slash timetables. Early assessment. P most promising are Corp E. Eager. Angry. A gamble. And A to B. Connected. Officers A recently stationed to Corbium. Possible for recruitment or stage two. Both seem willing to pledge but are otherwise ignorant to SG presence in Norda uh, LL. Lakelanders. Uh, Norda and the Lakelands, I guess is what they mean by that. Invaluable to have two operatives inside Corbium. We'll continue progress. Wait, continue to progress? Yeah, we'll continue progress. Request a fast track recruitment? Rise. Residon. Mm, excuse me. Alright. This one says, uh, operative, operative is chrono redacted, des designation ram, origin is redacted, destination is lamb at corvium. Request denied. Corp E and A to be non-essential. Move on from corvium. Continue assessing whistle contacts slash red web stage two assets. Rise. Rise it on. Uh, operative captain redacted, designation lamb, origin is corvium from Norda, destination is ram at redactum. Corvium intelligence vital to SG cause uh, sc oh Scarlet Guard okay Scarlet Guard cause at large request more time at location pass up to command firmly believes Corp E and A B are strong candidates okay. so then this next and says right as it all says rise right at the dawn of the end so I'm not gonna worry about that right now uh, this is from a operative general redacted designation drummer so this is general drummer this is command basically. Uh, origin is redacted. Lame at Corvium. Ram at redacted. Request denied. Orders are to continue stage one assessment for stage two slash assessment removal. Okay. And then operative is captain redacted. Designation lamb. Origin is Corvium from Norda. Designation is drummer. So we're going back to command. Uh, she's saying strong opposition. Many military assets present at Corvium. Must be assessed for stage two removal. Request more time at location. So basically she's saying like... You know, I, I get what you're She's like, I understand you're saying to not go ahead and go this, but... <laughs> she's putting the butt in there. So. All right. Then it says, uh, operative, general redacted, designation, drummer. Origin is redacted. Designation is lamb at Corvin, which is just request denied, move out. So basically saying no. Just go on, on get out of there. Basically. Okay. All right. Following protocol... I light the thin strip of correspondence paper on fire. The dot and dash is com detailing command orders char away to nothing, consumed by flame. I know the feeling. Hot anger licks at my insides. But I keep my face still for... It's either Kara or Kara. It's C-A-R-A. -A. I'm gonna say Kara, probably. Kara's sake. She looks on. Thick glasses perched on her nose. And... Hmm, Interesting. Wears glasses just like me. <laughs> uh, her fingers itch, ready to click out my response to orders she cannot read. No need, I say, waving her off. The lie sits on my mouth for a moment. Command bent. We stay. <laughs> All right. I bet the colonel's damned red eye is rolling in his skull right now. But his orders are orders are stupid, narrow-minded, and now command thinks the same. They must be disobeyed, for the cause. For the Scarlet Guard. Corporal Eastree and Barra would be invaluable to us. Not to mention they're both risking their lives to give me the information I need. The Guard owes them an oath, if not evacuation, in Stage 2. They aren't here in the, th they aren't here in the thick of things, I tell myself. It helps ease the stain of disobedience. <laughs> the Colonel Command don't understand what Corvia means to the Norton military. Or how imp important our, our information will become. Sorry, my no, my sinuses are draining. I can feel it and it hurts. It burns. <laughs> Give me just a second. There we go. I'm sorry about that. My sinuses are draining badly. Um, okay. The tunnel system alone is worth my time. It connects every piece of the fortress city. Allowing not only clandestine trip movements, but easy infiltration of Corvium itself. And thanks to Barra's position as an aide to a high-ranking silver, we know less savory intelligence as well. Which officers prefer the unwilling company of red soldiers? That Lord General Osanos, 
the ninth governor of the West Lakes region and commander of the city, continues a family feud with Lord General Olaris, commander of the entire Norton fleet, who is essential to the military and wear, who wears a rank for show. The list goes on. Penny rivalries, rivalries and weaknesses to be exploited. There are places of rot for us to poke at. If command doesn't see this, then they must be blind. But I am not. And today I, is the day I set foot inside the walls myself and see the worst of what Norda has to offer tomorrow's revolution. Kara folds up her broadcaster and reattaches it to the cord around her neck. It stays with her always, nestled next to her heart. Not even to the colonel? She asks. To glow? <laughs> Not today. I force my best smirk. It placates her. And it convinces me. The last two weeks have been a gold mine of information. The next two will certainly be the same. I force my way out of the stuffy, shuttered closet we use for transmissions. The only part of the abandoned house with four walls and an intact roof. The rest of the structure does its job well, serving as a safe house for our dealings in Corvium. The main room, as long as it is wide, has brick walls. The one side is collapsed along the rusted tin roof. And the smaller chamber, probably a bedroom, has no roof at all. Not that we mind. The Scarlet Guard has suffered worse. And the nights have been unseasonably warm, albeit humid. Summer is coming to Norda. Our plastic tents keep out the rain, but not the moist air. It's nothing, I tell myself. A mild discomfort. But sweat drips down my neck anyway. And it's not even midday yet. Yeah, that's one thing I'm going to pause briefly and say that with heat, like, whenever it's more humid than it is, like, a dry heat, it's, it, you will sweat. Like, it's muggy, you get sweaty, and it gets very hot very quickly in a weird way. Um, so if you're, like, somewhere like Nevada or in the desert where it's dry heat, like, don't be wrong, it can absolutely still get very, very hot. But a lot of times when you compare, like, a dry heat, like, the desert to a humid heat, like, you do, like, like, I live in Tennessee and everything, so when it rains in the summer, it, it, unless we somehow get very lucky and it's cool that day and there's a good breeze, it can get extremely muggy and hot, sweaty, like, a lot of times there are temperatures where there are days, like, if it's for continuous days, it's like, you should go swimming to cool down. Like, it's that kind of hot. Because, it, it, like, literally that, or, like, take a cold shower, or just do something cold. Mm, excuse me. So, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Continuing on. Okay. Trying to ignore the sticky sensation that comes with the rising humidity, I pile my braid on top of my hem. Wrapping it like a crown. If this weather keeps up, I might just cut it all off. He's late, Tristan says from his lookout at a glassless at a glassless window. His eyes never still, always darting, searching. I'd be worried if he wasn't. Barrow hasn't been on time once in the past two weeks, not for any of our meetings. Kara joins Ty in the corner, dropping down with a merry flop. She sets to clean her glasses as intently as Ty cleans pistols. Both of them share the same look. Fair-haired Lakelanders, like me. They're not used to the May heat, and they cluster together in the shade. Okay, so that kind of also gives us a part of time where, like, where, um, like, where in the year they are. And that's May. They're in May. Uh, the one thing I can say about, like, humid heat for May... A lot of times it's not, I mean, it's still pretty muggy and hot and stuff, especially depending on where you are in, I'd say in some of the southern region and everything in the U.S., but I also know that, like, compared to, like, June and July, May, it's hot, but I don't think it's as rainy. Ju like, there's been a lot of summers where, like, it'll get hot, but it'll be raining for days upon days, and, like, that was one of the reasons, um, this is slightly off topic, where... It was one of the reasons why we had to stop doing some of our garden stuff or at least move it over because it would rain so much. It would basically drench out the entire garden. Like, that's how much it would rain. And then combine all those days of rain with heat and it is muggy. It's hot. It's just a fun. It's just not fun. All right. Uh, here we go. Okay. Tristan is not so affected. He's a Piedmont boy originally. A son of mild whimper winter and swampy summer. That's a good way to describe it, a swampy summer. The heat doesn't bother him. In fact, the only indicator of the changing, changing season are his freckles, 
which seemed to breed. He dot his arms and face. More every day. And his hair is longer, too. A dark gray mop that curls in the humidity. I told him as much, Rasha says from the opposite corner. She busies herself braiding her hair out of her dark face, taking care to divide her bla curling black locks into even pieces. Her own rifle, not so long as Tristan's, but just as well used, props against the wall next to her. Starting to think they don't sleep down in Piedmont. If you want to know more about my sleeping habits, all you have to do is ask Rasha. Tristan replies. This time, he turns over his shoulder. Just for a second, to meet her black eyes. They share a knowing look. Ah, that's cute. Yeah. I fake the urge to scoff. Keep it to the woods, you two. I mutter. Hard enough sleeping on the ground without listening to wrestling tents. Scout's still out? Terry and Shore are taking the ridge. They won't be back until dusk. Same as Big Coop and Martinson. Distin ticks off the rest of our team on his of our team on his fingers. Christabel and Little Coop are about a mile out. In the trees. Waiting on your borrow boy. And looking to wait a while. I nod. All in order then. Command happy so far? Happy as they can be. I lie as smoothly as I can. Thankfully, Tristan doesn't turn from his watch. He doesn't notice the flush I feel creeping up my neck. We're feeding good intelligence. Worth our time, for sure. They're looking to owe the East Tree or borrow? What makes you say that? He shrugs. Seems like a long time to put into a pair we don't mean to recruit. Or are you suggesting them for stage two? Tristan doesn't mean to pry. He's a good lieutenant. The best I've ever seen. Loyal to his bones. He doesn't know what he's picking at. But it stings all the same. Still working that out. I mumble, doing best to walk slow as I run from his questions. I'm going to do a turn around the property. Grab me if Barrow grab me if Barrow shows his face. Will do, boss. Echoes from the room. Keeping my steps even is a battle, and it seems like an eternity before I am safely into the green trees. I have a single collecting breath, forcing myself to calm down. It's for the best. Lying to them, disobeying the orders. It's for the best. It's not your fault the colonel doesn't understand. It's not your fault. The old refrain levels me out, as comforting as a stiff drink. Everything I've done and everything I will do is for the cause. No one can say otherwise. No one will ever question my loyalty. Not once I give them Norda on a silver platter. A smile slowly replaces my usual scowl. My team doesn't know what's coming. Not even Tristan. They don't know what command has planned for this kingdom in the coming weeks. Or what we've done to put things in motion. Grinning, I remember the whirring video camera. The words I said in front of it. Soon, the world will hear them. I don't like the woods here. They're too still. Too quiet. With the smell of ash still clinging to the air. Despite the living trees, this is a dead place. Nice time for a walk. My pistol jams against his temple before I have time to think. Somehow, Barrow doesn't flinch. He only raises his palms in mock surrender. You're a special kind of stupid, I say. He chuckles. Must be, since I keep wandering back to your ragtag, Rebel Club. And you're late. I prefer chronologically challenged. Oh my god, that's awesome. I love that comment. <laughs> I feel like this is like, we're definitely seeing a bit of Mary and her brother and whatnot. And probably where he got, where she got um, some of her little bit of sarcasm. With a humorless scoff, I holster the gun. But keep my hand on it. I narrow my eyes at him. Usually his uniform is turned inside out for camouflage. But this time he hasn't bothered. His jacket is red as blood. Dark and warm. He sticks out against the greenery. I've got two spotters waiting on you. They must not be very good. Again, that smile. Another would think Shade Barrow was warm, open, always laughing. But there's a chill beneath all that. An iron cold. I came the usual way. Sneering, I pat his jacket. Did you now? There. His eyes flash. Chips of frozen amber. Shade Barrow has secrets of his own. Just like everyone else. Let me tell my crew you're here, I press on, taking a step back from Barrow's lean form. His eyes follow my movements, quietly assessing. He's only 19, little more than a year into his military service, but his training, training certainly stuck. You mean tell your watchdog? A cord of my mouth lifts. His name is Tristan. 
Tristan. Right. Ginger hair. Permanently glued to his rifle. Barrow gives, Barrow gives me my space, but follows all the same as I pick back toward the farmhouse. Funny. I never expected to find a Southie embedded with you. Southie? My voice doesn't quaver. This way, Barrow's not so vague probing. His pace quickens, uh, until he's almost stepping on my heels. I fade the urge to kick back into his knee. He's from Piedmont. Has to be. With his draw. Not that it's much of a secret. Just like the rest of your bunch. All Lake Randers, yeah? I glance over my so shoulder. What gave you that idea? And you're from the deep north, I suppose. Farther than our maps go on. He presses on. I get the feeling he enjoys this. Like a puzzle. So you're in for some fun come true summer. When the days run long and thick with heat. Nothing like a week of storm clouds that never break. And air that threatens to drown. No wonder you're not a trench soldier. I say as we reach the door. There's no need for a poet on the front lines. The bastard actually winks at me. Well, we can't all be brutes. I'm gonna guess that's where Shade kind of really started to, like... And, of course, like, maybe some context clues later will kind of show more. But I feel like this is kind of where he's kind of flirting her and kind of, getting, like, kind of starting to show, like... Hey, you know, I don't care if you're you're probably from Lake Lantern or blah, blah, blah. And I think you're cute or something like that. I don't know. Something like that. Anyway. Right. <clears throat> In spite of Tristan's many warnings... I follow Barrow unarmed. If I'm caught in Corvium, I can play it as a simple red Norton in the wrong place at the wrong time. But none of them carry my, my Lakelander pistol or well-worn hunting knife. Then it'll be execution on the spot. Not only for bearing arms without permission, but for being a Lakelander to boot. He'd probably slap me in front of a whisper for good measure, and that is the worst fate of all. While most cities sprawl, with smaller towns and neighborhoods ringing around their walls and boundaries, Corvium stands alone. Barrow stops just before. Uh, just before the end of the tree line, looking north at the cleared landscape around a hill. My eyes scanned over the fortress city, noting anything of use. I've pored over the stolen maps of Corvium, but seen with my own eyes is something else entirely. Black granite walls, spiked with gleaming iron as well as other weapons to be harnessed by silver abilities. Green vines, thick as columns, coil up the dozen or so watchtowers. A moat of dark water fed by piping rings that piping rings the entire city. And strange mirrors dot between the metal prongs vein in the par parapets. For silver shadows, I assume, to concentrate their ability to harness light. And of course, there are more traditional weapons to take stock of. The oil dark watchtowers bristle with grounded, heavy guns, artillery ready to fire on any and everything in the vicinity. And behind the walls, the buildings rise high, made tall by the cramped space. They too are black, tipped in gold and silver, a shadow beneath the brightest sunlight. According to the maps, the city itself is organized like a wheel, with roads like spokes, all branching from the central square used to muster armies and stage execu executions. The Iron Road marches straight through the city, from east to west. The western road is quiet, no marching this late in the afternoon, but the eastern blue eastern road bustles with transports, most of them silver issue, carrying blue blushing nobles and officers away from the fortress. The last, the slowest, is a red delivery convoy returning to the markets of Rakosta, the nearest supply city. It consists of servants in wheeled transports and horse-drawn carts, even on foot, all making the 25-mile journey only to rega return again in a few days. I fish the spyglass from my jacket and hold it to my eye, following the ragged train. A dozen transports, as many carts, maybe 30 reds walking, all slow, keeping pace with each other. It'll take them at least nine hours to get where they're going. A waste of manpower, but I doubt they mind. Delivering uniforms is safer than wearing them. As I watch, the last of the convoy leaves the eastern gate. The prayer gate, Barrow mutters. Hmm? He taps my glass, then point. We call it the prayer gate. As you enter, you pray to leave. As you leave, you pray to never return. I can't help but scoff. I didn't know Norda found religion. He only shakes his head. Then who do you pray to? No one, I guess. Just words, at the end of it all. Somehow, in the shade of Corvium, Shade Barrow's eyes find a bit of warmth. You get me in that gate, 
I'll teach you a prayer of my own. Rise, where's the dawn? Annoying as Barrow might be, I have a sneaking feeling he'll be a scarlet soon enough. He tips his head, watching me as keenly as I watch him. Deal. Although I don't see how you plan to do it, our best chance was that convoy. But unfortunately, you're... What did you say? Chronologically challenged? No one's perfect. Not even me. Your place of a shit-eating grin. But I said I'd get you inside today. And I mean what I say. Eventually. I look him up and down, gauge in his manner. I do not trust Barrow. Okay, so we're seeing a little bit of like how, I don't want to say he's flirting, but I want to say he's kind of flirting. He's got like that kind of flirty, like jokey nature, the sarcasm. And she's like kind of going along with it in a weird way, like going with the sarcasm of it, but she doesn't trust him right now. So that's interesting. All right, it's not in me to truly trust anyone. Makes sense. The risk is part of the game. How are you going to get me shot? His grin widens. I guess you'll have to find out. Well then, how do we do this? To my surprise, he extends a long-fingered hand. I stare at it, confused. Does he mean to skip up to the gates like a pair of giggling children? Frowning, I cross my arms and turn my back. Well, let's get moving. A curtain of blo black blots my vision as Barrow slips a scarf over my eyes. I would scream if I could. Signaling to Tristan to following us from a quarter mile away. But they are suddenly crushed from my lungs and everything seems to shrink. I feel nothing but the tightening world and the warm bulk of Barrow's chest against my back. Time spins. Everything falls. The ground tips beneath my feet. I hit concrete hard. Enough to rattle an already rattling brain. The blindfold slips off. Not that it does me much good. My vision spots. Black against something darker. All of it's still spinning. I have to shut my eyes again to convince myself I'm not spinning with it. My hands scrabble against something slick and cold. Hopefully water. As I try to push myself back up. Instead, I fall backward. And force my eyes to open it to find blue, dank darkness. The spots recede. Slow at first. Then all at once. What the f- I turn onto my knees. Throwing up everything in my belly. Okay, so this is where we get to see, really, Shade's ability and whatnot in action. And how Farley, uh, you know, felt it when she experienced it first. And, of course, uh, apparently it's the kind of feeling where afterwards, basically, you vomit, I guess. Or that's the feeling. Which I kind of know that feeling of, like, being really dizzy about to vomit, but still. Uh, Barrow's hands find my back, or hand finds my back, rubbing what he assumes are soothing circles, but his touch makes my skin crawl. I spit, finish retching, I force myself to uneasy feet, if only to get away from him. He puts a hand out to steady me, but I smack it away, wishing I'd kept my knife. Don't touch me, I snarl. What was that? What happened? Where am I? Careful. Careful, you're turning into a philosopher. I spit acidic bile at his feet. Borrow! I hiss. He sighs, annoyed as a school teacher. I took you through the pipe tunnels. There's a few in the tree line. I had to keep you blinded, of course. Can't let all my secrets go for free. Pipes my ass. We were standing outside a minute ago. Nothing moves that fast. Borrow tries his best to smother a grin. You hit your head, he says after a long moment. Passed out on the slide down. That would explain the vomiting. Concussion. Yet I've never felt so alert. All the pain and nausea of the last few seconds are suddenly gone. Gingerly, I feel along my skull. Searching for a bump or a tinder spot. But there's nothing at all. He watches my examination with strangely focused attention. Or do you think you ended up half a mile in the way, beneath the fortress of Corvium, some other way? No... I suppose not. As my eyes adjust to the glue, I realize we're in a supply cellar. Abandoned or forgotten, judging by the dust on the empty shelves and the inch of standing water on the floor. I avoid looking at the fresh pile of sick. Here, put these on. He fishes a grimy bundle of cloth from somewhere in the dark. Carefully hidden, but easy to find. It sails my way, 
colliding with my chest in a puff of dust and odor. Wonderful, I mutter, unfolding it to find a regulation uniform. It's well worn, patched and stained with who knows what. The insignia is simple, a single white bar outlined in black. An infantry soldier, enlisted, a walking corpse. Whose body did you swipe this off? The shock of cold sparks in him again. Only for a moment. It'll fit. That's all you need to worry about. Very well. I shrug out of my jacket without much fanfare, then peel off my battered pants and shirt in succession. My undergarments are nothing special, mismatched and thankfully clean. But Barrow stares anyway, his mouth open a little. Kitchen flies, Barrow? I taunt as I pull on the uniform trousers. In the dim light, they look red and battered as rusted pipes. Sorry, he mutters, turning his head. Then his body. As if I care about privacy. I smirk at the blush spreading up his neck. <clears throat> Excuse me. I didn't think soldiers were so embarrassed by the female form. I press on as I zip myself into the uniform top. It's snug, but fits well enough. Obviously meant for someone shorter, with narrow, narrower sold shoulders. There we go. He whips back around. The flesh has reached his cheeks. It makes him seem younger. No, I realize. It makes him seem his age. I didn't know Lakelanders were so free with them. I flash a smile as cold as his eyes. I'm Scarlet Guard, boy. We have worse things to worry about than naked flesh. Something trembles between us. A current of air, maybe. Or perhaps the ache of my head injury finally coming back. That must be it. I think this is where she's realizing that she actually really likes him, and she just doesn't realize it. Then Barrow laughs. What? You remind me of my sister. It's my turn to grin. You spy on her a lot, do you? He doesn't flinch at the jab. Lenny glanced past. In your manner, Farley, your ways. You think the same. She must be a bright girl. She certainly thinks so. Very funny. I think you two would be great friends. Then he tips his head, pausing for a second. Pausing a second. Or you might kill each other. For a second time, and second time in as many minutes, I reluctantly touch Barrow. This is not so gentle, as he ha as his hands on my back. Instead, I punch him lightly on the arm. Let's get moving, I tell him. I don't fancy standing around in a dead woman's clothes. Okay. I'll read a little bit of the Dakota messages, and then I think we're going to have to end it there. So let's go ahead and read these real quick. All right. Captain, return to orders. Command I won't stand for this. Ram. All right. Day 29 of Operation Shieldwall. Stage 2. Uh, operative is Colonel Redacted, designation Ram, origins Redacted, destination Drummer at Redacted. No contact from Lamb in two days. Request permission to intercept. Shield wall ahead of schedule. Island 3 operational, but transit problematic. More boats needed than previously thought. Okay, and of course the right is right as a dawn. Uh, okay, this one says, Oper it says operative is General Redacted, designation Drummer. Uh, origin is command at redacted. Destination, ram at redacted. Permission to intercept granted. We'll relay further to info. Info, R-E dot, uh, her location. Use force if necessary. She was your suggestion and your mistake if things continue. Get red web to stage two. Collab with other teams to begin removal. We'll explore other transit options for three. Uh, rise rather than Okay. Lamb, get your ass in line or it's your head. Ram. Okay, so, basically, uh, we're going to kind of stop here for now, but basically, we've now seen that she, that Farley has met Shade! Yay! We get to see how they met. That's awesome. I love this. Anyway, uh, I also like how we get to see a little bit of, like, now we see Shade's powers. We get to see um, how Farley and Shade kind of get along, as well as we get to see how Command and her father, uh, by father, I mean Farley's father, are like, what the hell are you doing? Like, or like, what the hell's going on? You know, they haven't heard from her in two days. Um, and so it's like, hey, you know, and so Ram, her father is like, hey, can I have your permission to intercept this and figure what's going on? And Command is like, yes, absolutely. Go and see what's going on. And this other stuff we will figure out. So that's kind of what they're saying at the moment. And that's unfortunately where we're going to have to end for the day. I'm so sorry that it has to be a little 
earlier than what we would like, guys. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, hopefully by next video, I hope we can do a bit longer if we can. But yeah, so there is all of that. Uh, thank you guys so very much just for watching and listening. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope you guys very thoroughly enjoyed. I'm loving Steel Scars. In fact, that we get to see what exactly was happening with Farley during the early stages of, you know, the Scarlet Guard. So, yeah, I'm hoping, I can, I'm kind of eager to see, like, what happens as the story continues on. Like, are we going to see more of, like, the later parts of the story? Are we going to see glim glimpses of, like, when Mare was captured? It's a curious thought. Anyway, with well, that being said, thank you again so very much for watching. I hope you all very thoroughly enjoyed, and I will see you all in my next video. Mwah!